morning. It's good to see all of you who don't have boats or a good friend with a boat uh, that are here this morning. Uh, today we're going to jump right into the sermon and we're going to be talking about a very difficult topic. It's a, it's a current hot button issue that you've probably seen talked about at length on Facebook and people have debated this. You know, some people think it's extremely dangerous. Uh, others think it's no big deal. You know, it only affects a small percentage of Americans. Uh, some think if it doesn't impact them personally, then, you know, then why should they care? But I think as a church, we need to address this issue. And that's why today we're going to be talking about shark attacks. Um, it's just all, all over and I'm just kidding. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about the uneasy topic uh, of this tension between the church and politics. The, the, this tension between the church and cultural issues. And I promise you I was already working on the content of this message before I knew what, that the Supreme Court was going to be, you know, making a decision on same-sex marriage uh, a week and a half ago. And that you would end up being bombarded with, with the argumentative vomit that's all over social media. Uh, so I know some of you are already sick of hearing all about this, and I don't want what I talk about this morning uh, to only be seen as if I'm talking about this one issue, because I'm not. But we will address it a little bit, uh, but that's not the only thing. What, what we will be talking about today will address some of this tension between the church and cultural and political issues, and will definitely relate to, to the recent Supreme Court ruling. Uh, the title of today's message, we've titled it The Separation of Church and Hate. Uh, to kind of talk about this 4th of July weekend, we thought we'd go with this theme. And it seems like we're so polarized in this nation, aren't we? You know, there's so much hate and, and biting sarcasm that's being spewed all over the place. I was listening to a message by Andy Stanley. He's the, the preacher at North Point Church in Atlanta. And he was talking about how at one time he had read that President George W. Bush, while he was in office, used to have a daily quiet time. And in that quiet time, he would read uh, Andy Stanley's father's devotional book. And so... Andy mentioned this in his sermon, basically saying, you know, if the President of the United States has enough time to make a, for a quiet time, then, then we should too. And he said, oh my gosh, After just mentioning the President of the United States, he got so much criticism and nasty emails and people saying, you know, I thought we weren't a political church. And some saying, how could you support this President when he blah, 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 blah. And he said, all, all I was doing was saying, if the President had time to make for a quiet time, then, then you should too. Uh, but just the mention of the President raised tension and frustration and hatred. And then a few years ago, he was saying that the, the, the First Lady, Michelle Obama, visited their church, and, and they welcomed her. And he said, oh my goodness, we got all these nasty emails and comments from people. How could we welcome in the First Lady? How could we do that into, to our church? Uh, I thought we were in a political church. How could we support her when she blah, 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 blah. And, and he was like, why would we turn away someone from our church? It just was ridiculous. And so, as a church, we will never be Republican enough for some people. And as a church, we will never be Democrat enough for some people. I mean, shoot, just the mention of the word government, we have all our libertarians having a conniption, right? And so uh, this type of topic just carries with it so much baggage and emotion and unfortunately, hatred. Now, typically when I preach, what I, I like to do is, is uh, what I prefer to do is kind of go through a section of scripture like we did with this Roman series. Just walk through verse by verse, kind of go over what it means, what the author's original intent was, and then talk about how it applies to our lives. We would call this kind of an exegetical approach. But for this message, I'm taking more of a general approach. More like, here are some general principles that we see throughout the New Testament, and, and, and that's kind of the approach that we're going to look at this. But as I've been processing what I was going to tell you this morning, my, I, I got to be honest, this has been a struggle for me to put together. My thoughts have been all over the place. My mind has just been racing and how I was going to put it together. And I, I got to realizing after I, you know, was getting in on this, that if I don't get this right, if it doesn't come across the way I intend, I'm going to offend a lot of people. And I thought, but if I get it right, if, if I do it right this morning, if it comes across the way I intend, then I'm going to offend everybody this morning, okay? Because God, God's word is offensive. Let's just face it. We as sinners should be offended by, by God's word. In fact, it's pretty offensive to the one who never sinned as well because he's the one who gave his life for, to save sinners. And that was a pretty offensive thing that he did. Now, most of you are aware, or many of you might be aware, 
that I preach at our Taze Valley campus, and we've been looking for a little while for a permanent facility. We meet at the movie theater in Taze Valley, and, uh, and it's been a great home for us, and it still is a great home for us, but it, it gets a little taxing. I, I, I was actually there this morning at 7.30 helping set up and then came here to preach because we have to set up every week. We don't just have this stuff sitting up here. And so, you know, it gets, it gets taxing, and we need a permanent home there. And so we were looking uh, at this warehouse. It was right next to the movie theater. We were thinking of... of uh, purchasing it. Uh, we had gone and visited it a couple times, met with, a, met with the owner of the building, and uh, so we were in the process of, of doing some groundwork, you know, behind the scenes work of getting some financing together and figuring out uh, how we could finance it and how we could do all that work, and we were pretty close to uh, putting down, a, you know, putting an offer in on this, this property, this warehouse, and uh, just before we were ready to put an offer, just before we had everything finalized to go ahead and, and say, yep, we're ready to put an offer, we found out that Suddenlink had leased this building. And so I, I was pretty disappointed. This wasn't great news for me. I thought, you know, I thought this is where God was leading us. I, I wasn't sure, but, we, you know, we thought this is where God was leading us, and obviously it wasn't, but it was still pretty disappointing. And I had to announce it to our Taze Valley campus that we would not be getting this building. We had asked them to be praying over it and praying over it and praying over it. And so I got up and announced that, that we didn't get this building, that Suddenlink had gotten it. And, and so I called for a boycott of Suddenlink. Now, for some of you, you realize that I'm joking when, I, when I'd done that, but others of you, you've been around the church long enough to know that, you know, you've seen throughout the years that the churches have been against everything, and you've seen how they've just boycotted everything. I've heard of ch churches boycotting, you know, Abercrombie and Fitch, Disney, Starbucks. Some of you are like, that's just too far. You know, I need my coffee, right? Uh, Starbucks, they, they've, you know, churches have boycotted Procter and Gamble and Johnson and Johnson. And if they did that, that at the same time, they would have just been the smelliest of people because that's where all your toiletries come from, right? They, they've boycotted Dockers and Pepsi and Coke and just about anything you can think of. People have boycotted. Christians have boycotted over the years. Er, early on, when I had first started here at Gateway, I'd maybe been here a year, year and a half or something like that. I was leading our student ministry, and uh, we had, uh, I had started this thing with the student ministry called a senior's prom. It was a prom, prom for seniors 55 and over, and our teens were putting it on. It was a great way for our teens to not only serve the senior adults, but really engage with them. And so we had to sell tickets for this event because it was a very costly event, and we, we never made anything close to what it cost for us to put it on, but we had to kind of know how much food to order. So I'm out there one day in the old kid zone, in the kid zone lobby now, uh, and I was, I was selling tickets for this event. And I had an older lady come up to me, and I had never met her before. But she came up to me, and she goes, she looked at me, and she goes, this church used to be against dancing. And now look. And she turned and walked away. And I thought, well, it was nice to meet you. Uh, I, I didn't realize that our church had been against dancing, and it's funny because our elders didn't know we were against dancing. Dave Stauffer didn't know we were against dancing, but apparently we were against dancing. Uh, by the way, did I mention we're putting on a dance for people with special needs this Thursday. We'd love to have you help with that. But, uh, Besides this dancing thing, you know, there were usually some very good underlying reasons why churches would boycott these companies, why they would be against them. And to be honest, I typically agreed with why, you know, what it was that these, these churches were upset about. You know, usually these companies would, would take a stand or make a statement about something that, that was morally out of sync with biblical teaching. But it always came across strange that the church was always against things. Some of you have heard Dave Stoffer talk about this. I, I've heard him tell this a few times, how early on when he was here, he's been here almost 20 years, but early on when he was here, he saw some, uh, some Christians in our community picketing something. And, uh, and, and he agreed with why they were picketing. But while he agreed with the reason, he didn't really agree with their approach. He didn't, uh, and he just, he said he watched them do this. And he thought, what are they doing? You know, are they really making a difference? And I remember him saying this, and, and he said it again several times. He said, I'd rather be a church that's known for what we are for than a church that's known for what we are against. Yet it seems like the church in America has, has been known more for what we are against than what we are for. It seems as though the church in America has been more concerned about making a point than making a difference. And the reason is because it is much easier to make a point 
than it is to make a difference. Let me say that again. It is always easier to make a point than it is to make a difference. And that's one of my points for today. So, but if you make a point, you know, you, always, you, you feel better when you make a point, right? You can even, even gather a, a crowd when you make a point. But making a difference, man, that takes far longer. It's confusing to your constituents, right? It's slow going. It's steady plotting. It's confusing to both sides of the issue that you're trying to make a difference on. Those, those of you who are parents, you, you know this. You know, we, we do this sometimes. Our kids get in trouble and we're like, that's it. I'm, I'm going to lay down the law this time. You know, uh, I'm going to really give it to them. And, and, and so we, we do. We give it to them. We put our foot down. We give them a good talking to and we send them to their room thinking, that was good. I let them have it. And they're just sitting in their room. They're pondering all of the wise things that I have told them. And they're going to come out different. No, they're not. They're playing on their iPhone or, you know, uh, playing Candy Crush or something stupid like that, right? And, and, and then you wonder why they, they, they don't change. Here's why. See, telling someone that they are wrong is different than guiding someone to do what is right. I'm not saying you don't tell your child that they're doing something wrong. Obviously you do, but then you have to guide them to do what is right. Trying to convince someone that they, someone that they are wrong is different than equipping someone to do what is right. But what many churches have done is that they have shouted to people what they have done wrong rather than engaging with those people to help them do what's right. It's, it's, it's not that the church has been wrong, right? We are, they're standing up for the truth, standing up for what is right. But the question we need to ask is, are we really making a difference in this approach? Because again, it's easy to make a point, especially when people agree with you, right? Especially when it's someone like me who gets to wear a microphone and stand in front of a crowd and make points and, 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 and people, you know, pretend to listen and things like that, right? And you get patted on the back and sometimes you get a rousing amen, you know, because you stood for truth. It's easy to make a point. It's easy to make a point. I mean, look at political speeches. You have these politicians who get up and they have all of these people who are their supporters. And so they're all gathering and they're cheering every time they make a point. Every time they take a jab at their opponent, they cheer. And, and so it's easy to make a point. But it is very, very, very difficult to make a difference. And so unintentionally, people have gotten this impression that the church's motto is this. Become like us and then you can join us. Become like us, and then you can, in, can join us. So, so you're non-Christian, and so you non-Christians out there, you, you stop having abortions, stop having gay sex, stop saying bad words, stop cheating on your spouse, stop using drugs, and then once you've cleaned up your life, then come on over to our church and we'll tell you about Jesus. Like, get your act together, and then you can come to our church and we'll introduce you to Jesus. Is that how it's supposed to work? Isn't Jesus the one who changes someone to begin with? So, to make a difference requires a completely different strategy than the strategy required to make a point. And the New Testament, thank goodness, gives us a great roadmap of how to make more than just a point, but make a difference. Because as you read through the New Testament, especially seeing examples and teachings of Jesus and Paul, and seeing the examples of, and the work of the early church, you can see that they did more than just stand up and make a point and shout it out to people. In fact, they rarely did that. But they did make a difference. I mean, an amazing difference. Think about it. Within about 300 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Roman Empire embraced Christianity. Within 300 years, Christianity top, toppled an empire in regard to ideology. And Christianity toppled a religious system that had been in place for thousands of years. Now, 300 years may sound like a long time, but we're talking about a core group of 12 uneducated guys who followed Jesus. And then this movement of difference-making exploded to the point that it dominated one of the most powerful empires in human history, the Roman Empire. And the way they did it was not just by standing up and making a point. They couldn't do that. They, they had no platform. They had no leveraging authority. They had no money. They had nothing. So, so what did they have? Let's look at some, some principles and examples of what they did have, what they did do. And one of the things that the, we, we see that they did is they leaned relationally in the direction of those they disagreed with most. They leaned directionally 
or leaned relationally, I'm sorry, in the direction of those they disagreed with most. They were constantly building bridges to the people that they wanted to influence. And, and wouldn't this be nice to see in our government today, right? Wouldn't it be nice to see our politicians leaning in relationally into the direction of those they disagreed with most, most and, and working together? That would be great, wouldn't it? At Gateway, we believe that all Christians have been called uh, to, to be on mission. And our mission is to what? It's to make disciples. That's what we're here for, to make disciples. That's our mission. And if you've been here with, uh, for us with, with a, for a little while, you know that we have a, we've kind of come up with a definition. Actually, someone else came up with it. We stole it. Uh, but we have this definition for what it is to be a disciple. And it comes from Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus called his first disciples. And so from what he called them to, we, we've kind of come up with a definition of what it means to be a disciple. So let's read Matthew 4, 18 to 20. We'll see what Jesus called his first disciples to do. He says this, it says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And once they left their nets and followed him. And so according to this passage, we, we read in this passage, we define disciple as this. A disciple is one who is following Jesus. Jesus said, come, follow me. Now this is an initial decision to follow Jesus, but this is also a daily decision to follow Jesus. It, it doesn't end. We, we want to continually follow Jesus. The second thing is, not only are they following Jesus, it's someone, a disciple is someone who is being changed by Jesus. Jesus said, come follow me, and I will make. He's going to be doing something in you. He's going to be changing you. And again, this is a process, right? It's a continual process. We're never there. We're continually being changed by Jesus. And then third, it's someone who is on mission for Jesus. Come follow me, and I will make you what? Fishers of men. The mission of a disciple is to make more disciples. And as you know, we've tried to pound this idea that we want to make disciples, and we believe that the best and most biblical approach to making disciples is what we have called relational discipleship. Where you build a relationship with someone with the intention of discipling them. This is what Jesus did, right? He, he called a few guys together to follow him, and, and then he lived with them, he taught them, he shared with them, he lived his life with them, and, and then he sent them on mission to make more disciples. Relationship is the key, and relationships are so important. I mean, think about the people who have made the greatest impact, the greatest difference in your life. For the most part, they're people who invested in your life relationally, right? So I want to take a look at an interesting passage in Acts chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, open up to there. In Acts chapter 17, it gives us an example of how Paul leaned relationally in the direction of some people he would have certainly disagreed with. Now, if you know much about the Apostle Paul, you know that, you understand, you know that he, he understood his Hebrew scripture. He, he dove into the Hebrew scripture. He knew it. He was, he was a Pharisee at one point, and he knew his Hebrew scripture. And the predominant law of the Hebrew scripture was to have no other gods before the one true God, and, and then to make no images and worship these, these false gods, these idols, no, no idol worship. I mean, it's like the first two commands of the Ten Commandments, right? So Paul goes into the city of Athens, and, and, and Athens was a very polytheistic culture. They worshipped many, many gods. And so he's walking around the streets of Athens, and he sees all these different images of gods, all these objects of worship, and, and, and they had a god for everything. In fact, they even had an altar to an unknown god. And, and just in case they'd missed a god, they could say, well, we, we did have this altar to this unknown god. We just didn't know your name. We didn't know what you looked like, but we worshipped you anyway, right? So they had all these gods in this one altar to an unknown god. And so what would have been the easiest sermon for Paul to preach while he was in Athens? To preach against idolatry, right? To say, look, you guys are wrong. These are, aren't real gods. These are false gods. You need to take them down and burn them and worship the one true god. And had he done that, he would have been exactly right. But he would have made little difference. So listen to what he does do. Listen to what he does say in Acts 17, starting in verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Well, what's he doing here? He's finding common ground with these people, isn't he? He's like, I I'm, I'm religious too, right? Verse 23, for as I walk around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I I've studied you, I understand you, 
I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you're very ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. He says, this unknown God that you worship, this is what you're missing. And then he begins to preach the gospel, even sprinkling in a little quote from one of their poets. And so, get this, he doesn't preach against idolatry necessarily. He preaches for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, also makes his point about idolatry. And what happens? Some people leave and they think he's crazy. But a few say, we, we want to hear more about this. We want to hear more about you on this subject. We want to hear more about this guy, Jesus. And some of them actually become believers, including a man named Dionysius and a woman named Damaris. But Paul didn't come into Athens and, and shouting and firing away and holding up signs that say, turn or burn and all polytheists are going to hell, right? He built relational bridges with these people that he absolutely disagreed with. And from there, he didn't just make a point. He made a real difference. Another thing we see in Jesus and the Apostle Paul and in the early church is that they were not concerned about guilt by association. They were not concerned about guilt by association. Now let me be clear. This is not a parenting strategy, okay? Yeah, this isn't go home and tell your kids, oh, I don't care who you associate with. No, no. But Think about this. What was Jesus' reputation, especially among the Pharisees? He was a friend of who? Tax collectors and sinners. Let's look at Mark chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. It says this about Jesus. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house. Now, now Levi is also Matthew. Um, and, and Matthew, Levi, Matthew, he was a tax collector who had turned disciple, but here he's still a tax collector. So while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Wait, wait, wait a second. They, they hung out with Jesus? They, they followed Jesus around, yet they, yet they still lived like this? I'm confused. Verse 16. When the teachers of the law who were, who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they saw Jesus doing this, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. They're thinking, but, but Jesus, by hanging out with tax collectors, are you... Are you saying it's okay to cheat people? By, by hanging out with sinners, are you saying it's okay to sin then? And I can just imagine Jesus going, are you kidding me? You, you don't think I take sin seriously? You think I'm condoning sin? Do you realize that sin will ultimately kill me? What do you mean I, am I condoning sin? I'm trying to save sinners. You know what's interesting about all this? Is that Jesus and his followers were at odds the most with the religious leaders of the day. Yet if Jesus or his, or his disciples or, or Paul were to take a religious quiz, do you know what group of people that they would have, they would have most associated with, that they would have identified most with, that they would have agreed with most theologically? The Pharisees. The Pharisees and Jesus and Paul would have lined up pretty closely with each other in regard to theology, in regard to doctrine. But their approach was vastly different. It was worlds apart. While the Pharisees avoided those, those who were more visibly sinful, outwardly sinful, and hung around people who looked like them and talked like them and acted like them, Jesus wasn't concerned about what it looked like for him to be around the people that the Pharisees would have avoided. And therefore... Jesus and those who followed him constantly butted heads with the people that they agreed with most theologically. At Gateway, there are several women involved in what's, what we've called our new creation ministry. And sorry men, this is only a ministry for women, basically because these women go into the strip clubs in Jefferson. And they minister to women who, who dance there for a living. And they, they, they do this to help meet, they go and help meet some of their uh, physical needs, hoping then to be able to make a bridge that helps meet some of their spiritual needs. And it's led to some amazing work over there. 
Now, of course, it would be much easier, be so much easier if, for us to just walk the streets of Jefferson and, and hold signs saying that we're against strippers, we're against these clubs, we're against these dancers. But all we would be doing is what? Making a point and not making a real difference. And I'm sure that there are some people who call themselves Christians and they would be appalled that we would have a ministry like this. That we would have Christian women hanging out in these clubs and hanging around these dancers. They might say, now by going, by going to these clubs and meeting these women, aren't, aren't we endorsing their lifestyle? Aren't we condoning what they're doing? Uh, why would we try and help these people out? Shouldn't they change their ways first and then we help them out? You know, like, Make them kind of earn, sort of earn our help. But by going there, aren't we endorsing their sin? And the resounding answer is, no, we are not endorsing their sin. We are endorsing a Savior who saves us from our sins. We are, let me make this clear, we are not against those dancers. We are for those dancers. It is not the healthy who need a doctor. It is the sick. So Jesus was not scared of guilt by association, but Jesus wasn't guilty by participation either, right? He hung around the tax collectors and sinners, but he didn't participate in their sins. He hung around the tax collectors and sinners, not because he loved what they were doing, but because he actually, get this, he actually loved them. Another thing we see the early church do, and this is huge, this is huge. They didn't judge non-Christians for behaving like non-Christians. <laughs> That's a novel idea, right? They didn't judge non-Christians for behaving like non-Christians. You know why so many people in our country think that Christians are judgmental, hateful, bigoted, and intolerant? Because we've become so good at judging non-Christians for behaving like non-Christians and haven't done such a good job of judging Christians for behaving like non-Christians. Now, some of you immediately are thinking, well, we shouldn't judge at all, right? Doesn't Jesus say that? I mean, I've seen it all over Facebook. Judge, Christians aren't to judge. Jesus said, don't judge. And Jesus does say, judge not. Unfortunately, this, he says this in Matthew 7. Unfortunately, this is the way that most people read that passage of Scripture, right? <laughs> judge not. And then they don't read the rest of it, right? So we're going to read the rest of it, okay? Is that all right with you? This is what it says in Matthew 7. Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be judged, it will, it will be measured to you. So this is pretty clear, right? We're not to judge. But what does judge mean? Right? Because in a, in a little bit, we're going to read another passage that instructs Christians to judge. Is the Bible contradicting itself? And then if we read a little bit further in this passage of Scripture, it's going to almost sound like Jesus contradicts himself because he, he, it's going to seem like he tells us to do some judging. So what's going on there? Well, let's clarify what judging means. There is a judgment that only belongs to God. God's judgment to eternal life or eternal condemnation. And we don't have the right to stand and decide whether or not someone else is going to hell. We don't get to hold the gavel and say, hell or heaven. That's God's place. Okay? And that's, that's the judgment this part of Jesus' teaching is talking about. And he's talking about, therefore, demonstrating grace to people. Okay? But judgment can also mean some other things. It can mean discernment. Right? You make a judgment call when you decide whether to invest your money in your local bank or in an IRA or a mutual fund, right? When you, when you decide, let's say you decide to invest some money in an investment firm instead of just a, a, a savings account at your local bank. And so you go with this investment firm. Does your local bank call you up and say, why didn't you go with us? You're, you're just being judgmental, right? Why are you judging us? You're like, because I can make more money, right? You're making a judgment call. You're discerning what would be the best route to take. And then there's another type of judgment. There's, there's the judgment of, of heaven and hell that we don't get to make. Then there's a judgment of discernment. And then there's this type of judgment where you correct something that's out of place. 
Going back to the banking analogy here, if, if I decide to take out a loan from my bank for $100,000 and they're gonna, they, they, we agree to a 4% rate, we sign the deal, and then after we've signed this agreement, my bank says, you know what, we've decided to change the rate to 10%. Is it judging to say, wait, you, what you're doing is wrong. You aren't doing what you said you were going to do. Does, does the bank say, well, just let us be. Stop judging us, Right? This isn't judgment to eternal condemnation. It's holding someone accountable or helping correct them. It's holding someone accountable to what they say they're going to do or helping correct them, which is a form of judging. Jesus speaks of this when he continues in Matthew chapter 7. He says, why do you, in verse 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? A little bit of sarcasm here, hyperbole. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all the time, or out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye. So he's like, you're, you're going to critique? You're going to judge someone else, but you have all this junk going on in your life? Hold on. Hold on. That, that doesn't seem right. How are you going to correct someone when you haven't corrected yourself first? So first, take care of your issues, your sin. Repent of your sin, and then what? Then ignore the problem of your brother, right? Let him be. Don't judge him, right? No. It says, and then, after you've judged yourself, then you will be able to see, see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You will be able to help correct them, guide them to what is right. Jesus, that sounds pretty judgmental, doesn't it? So the early church didn't judge non-Christians for behaving like non-Christians. Yet the church today has become an expert at the opposite of this. And I've got to tell you, the church loses its influence in culture because they try to police the behavior of people who aren't even part of the church. They lose their influence in culture. But conversely, the church has its greatest influence in culture— throughout history, when churches police their own behavior and realize that people who have never embraced Christianity aren't going to live according to Christian principles. What a concept, huh? <laughs> right? So here's what, what the Apostle Paul taught. He said this. He asked this question in 1 Corinthians 5.12. He said, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? The implication is none. You have no right to judge those outside the church. Why in the world would we hold people who aren't even Christian accountable to a set of rules they haven't even subscribed to? That's ridiculous. The church shines brightest, though, when the church, when Christians act like Christians. Hmm, novel idea, right? And when Christians refuse to police their own behavior, yet police everyone else's outside of the church, you know what that's called? starts with an H and it rhymes with hypocrisy. <laughs> hypocrisy. And people see that a mile away. And so Paul says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Ah, are you not to judge those inside? And the implication is, here is, yes. Not those outside the church, yes to those inside the church. God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. So many Christians want to spout, don't judge me. You can't judge me. When Paul says, if you call yourself a Christian, you signed up to live a certain way and be judged according to that way. This isn't supposed to be judgment to eternal condemnation, but it is judgment of accountability with the goal. The goal is repentance and restoration. It's correction. And this is what the early church did. Paul didn't go into Athens and say, gosh, I can't believe that all these people are worshiping these idols. Of course they're worshiping idols. They're not Jewish. They're not Christian. He never expected non-Christians to behave like Christians. But he would get on the church all the time to pursue holiness and repent of their sin. And this is what gets the church in a lot of trouble, generation after generation after generation. You guys want to know why we have, we've gotten to the point in America where same-sex marriages is, is accepted by our government and, and, and by so many people in our country, and it's endorsed by people? Here's why. Because Christians haven't been policing their own behavior when it comes to sexual purity. That's why. 
We have people who claim to be Christians, yet they're living together before they're married. We have people who say they're Christians, yet they're having heterosexual sex outside of marriage. We have people who are Christians, who while they're Christians, have had two or three divorces, yet they're saying, I stand for traditional marriage. We have Christians who are addicted to pornography. No wonder why when we try to point out to the world that homosexual, homosexual activity is considered sinful in the Bible, people in our world just don't listen. They're like, yeah, and what about your sexual sin? It just doesn't come off right. It comes off really horribly, doesn't it? You say, well, Steve, shouldn't we be concerned about people's behavior? Shouldn't we be concerned about where our country is headed? Shouldn't we be concerned about the Supreme Court ruling? And the answer is absolutely. Yes, we should be. In fact, if you call yourself a Christian and aren't concerned about these things, then I'm concerned for you, okay? I'm concerned by the number of people who call themselves Christians yet don't have a Christian worldview. Don't think biblically. There, as Romans 1 talks about, they approve of those who practice immoral things like homosexuality and sex outside of marriage. I'm concerned about so many people who call themselves Christians yet are so easily swayed by cultural sh shifts rather than the word of God. And that's why we need to start building relational bridges with the people that we disagree with so that we can begin to influence them and actually make a difference, not just stand up and make a point. That's why we need to be judging what's going on in our house where we come across looking like a fool to outsiders. One more thing I want to talk about be, that we see the early church doing is this. They shined in the darkness. They shined in the darkness. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus teaches this. He says, you are the light of the world. Now the implication here is that the world is in darkness. Can you relate to that? You feeling like that right now? Does it feel like our world is pretty dark right now? I feel like that. And it was for the early Christians as well. This is nothing new. The world is dark. And guess what? God has placed a light in the world. And who is it? You. Me. You are the light of the world, he says. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And we may not understand this analogy as well, but the best way I can describe it is to think of a time that you're, you're in an airplane at night and you're flying into a major city. And as you're coming in, you see it all brightly, brightly lit up, right? You, you, it can't be hidden. A lit, lit up city just can't be hidden. It's shining. It's obvious. He says, you are like a city on a hill, a town on a hill. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. That'd be ridiculous. It doesn't do any good there. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And so you're like, okay, Jesus, I'm tracking with you, but what's your point? In the same way, he says, let your light shine before others that they may see your what? Let's say it together. They may see your good deeds, not billboards, not picket signs. I'm not saying I'm against these things. Jesus would be against these things, but here's what should be obvious. Here's what should be shining, your good deeds. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds. And what would be the end result? They glorify your Father in heaven. And it's at, at this point that the religious leaders would, wanting to, would be wanting to stop Jesus and say, well, but, but Jesus, what about truth? What, what about what's right? What about drawing a line in the sand? What about teaching the law of God and the holiness of God? And of course, Jesus could read their minds. And so he follows up this statement by saying this in verse 17. He says, do not think, and they're like, that's what I was doing. I was just thinking, okay. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. They're thinking, well, wait a minute. If, if we're supposed to just be good people who attract people with our, our good deeds, what about the law though? And Jesus is like, don't worry. I'm not giving up on the law. It's still there. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. This isn't an either or, right? It's not grace or truth. It's grace and truth. It's, it's not either or. It's both and. It's both and. You don't have to throw out moral and ethical and behavioral grenades into our culture and tell people outside the church how to live their life. You just get it right. You just get it right and follow Jesus and start engaging with people who don't believe and you will be like a light in a dark, dark room. And here's what it looks like. Here's what it looked like with these early Christians who were under the darkness of the Roman government. 
After Jesus had, had, had ascended, after Paul was executed by Emperor Nero, uh, after the New Testament was, was written and closed and all the apostles had, had either been martyred or killed, uh, the next few centuries, the Christians really started to get this right. And they truly shined in the darkness. A number of years after the close of the New Testament, there were several major plagues that hit the Roman world. Some, some historians believe it was two, three, four, they don't know. So about three major plagues hit the Roman world. And during these plagues, it is documented that the pagans, they would abandon these cities where there were lots of, of people who were, who were getting sick by these plagues. And it started with the rich pagans. They would abandon the cities and get out of there. And then the, the pagan priests started abandoning the cities. And they just left. And so you, what was left in the cities was the poor and the average people. They were left in the cities to just rot and be infected by these plagues. They were there left to die. And some have argued that the rise of Christianity was contingent upon how Christians responded to these plagues. Because all these people were fleeing, yet it's documented that in many of the cities, the Christians stayed in the cities. They didn't run. They stayed and they took care of their family members. In fact, with their care, they were able to nurse some of them back to health. Whereas the pagans, they were just leaving their families. They were just tossing them in the streets and abandoning the cities and bolting because they were afraid of the plague. They were afraid of dying. But the Christians didn't fear death. They had a greater hope. They didn't fear death, and so they stayed, and they started caring for their own. And once they cared for their own, they began to care for the pagans who had been left in the city to die. They started caring for the babies and the children who were just left in the streets, abandoned, left to rot and die and be infected with this plague. And the Christians shined because they stayed, and they helped, even though the plagues were killing people. Marcus Aurelius, many of you know that name from the movie Gladiator. He's a historical figure. He didn't die by his son strangling him. He actually died from one of these plagues. But in one of his letters that he had wrote, he had talked about these plagues, and he said, on some days, there were as many as 5,000 bodies a day being taken out of the city. Dead bodies were being taken out. That's how big this plague was. Now, some believe he was exaggerating. No matter what, this, this, this plague, these plagues were annihilating entire cities. And in this diseased environment, Christians rose to the occasion. They shined in the darkness. They were the light of the world. And by the time of Constantine, by the time Constantine came along, he embraced Christianity. And persecution of Christians stopped, and Rome actually became a Christian nation. But what many of you may not know is that Many of you have heard that before, but you may not know that a couple emperors later, there was this guy who rose to power, Emperor Julian. He was in charge. They called him Julian the Apostate. And under his reign, he wanted to, to take things back to, to paganism. Back, back to his roots. I'm going to offend everyone here. Take it back to their founding fathers, right? And so Emperor Julian decided to reinstitute paganism in Rome, but he ran into opposition. He tried to get it going, but the trouble with this move was that Christianity had such incredible momentum, and Christianity was known so much for its generosity and its benevolence, that when Julian tried to reinstitute the, the pagan priests, it just didn't take it all off. It, it never gained any traction. And, and we actually have a fragment of a letter that he wrote. And in this letter, Emperor Julian, he's complaining. He's complaining that, that paganism isn't, you know, coming back because of these Christians. And so listen to a couple things he wrote. It's very interesting. This is about 355 to 365 AD. Listen to what he's complaining about. He says this, Recent Christian growth is caused by their, quote-unquote, moral character, even if pretended, and by their benevolence towards strangers. He's like, we have a problem. The Christians are too moral. <laughs> We, we can't compete with them. Now, I don't, think, I don't think what they're doing is, you know, sincere. I think it's fake, but, but they're just so moral, we can't compete with them. He says in another part, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the priests, that's the, the pagan priest, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the pagan priests, the impious Galileans, the Christians, uh, they observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. So, He's saying, we, we neglected them. We neglected the poor. And they started caring for them. Man, that's terrible. Why, how could they do that? This is really going to mess things up for us. And then it gets worse for him. He says this, the impious Galileans support not only their poor, but ours as well. People they didn't even agree with. Everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. 
It's like the Christians keep doing all these good things. They keep taking care of the poor, and they keep being so generous, and keep living so morally upright. They just keep being, being so benevolent, and no one is wanting to join our cult if they keep doing this. They're turning this empire upside down. These Christians are making a difference. And so maybe, maybe you've been upset about the, the, the direction our country is headed. I, I am. You'd love to see it change. You'd love to see it turn around. You want to make a difference. Then maybe, maybe it doesn't start with a Facebook rant or the pointing of, of fingers at non-Christians. Maybe it starts with us. Maybe it starts with us as Christians repenting of our sin and then engaging relationally with the people who don't agree with us. It's not easy. It's not as easy. But would you rather make a point or make a difference? Second Chronicles 7 14 is kind of one of those passages that you just, you read every Independence Day. You know, it's, it's just so good. And it's where God says this. He says, if my people who are called by my name, that's us, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and tell other people outside of the church to turn from their wicked ways, no, my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And if they will turn from their wicked ways, if I will turn from my wicked ways, if you will turn from your wicked ways, if we would just come together and turn from our wicked ways, then God says, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin. And what will happen to their land? I will heal their land. So maybe it's time that we do some repenting. Maybe it's time we do some introspective analysis on our own lives and see where we're falling short and repent of our sin so that we don't just make a point. We actually make a difference. Maybe it's time that we step across the line and engage with people we don't agree with so that we can intentionally build bridges with the intent of discipling them instead of pointing across the line and saying, change, and then come join us. Let's start making a difference, not just a point. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that as we read through the New Testament, there's so much we can glean from it. So much that we can take from it through your teachings and your example and the example of your followers and, and how they truly understood your word and lived it out. So God, this morning, we want to pray for our nation. We want to pray for our leaders who have the task of, of guiding this nation. That they have such a heavy load ahead of them. And I'm afraid as many, many Christians aren't lifting them up in prayer. So today, we want to do that. We want to pray for our leaders. We want to pray for our government. And I know many of us feel discouraged Many of us feel dismayed at what's going on in our government. I, I, I've been one of them. I've, I've listened and heard what's going on and, and I've just become so discouraged and down about it. But God, I pray that we would turn our eyes to you and realize you're still in control. You're still sovereign. You still reign. <laughs> this, this isn't slowing you down. And so, God, I pray that we would trust in you, that we would trust in your word, that we would not necessarily point fingers, but we would point it at ourselves and humble ourselves. We would seek your face. We would continually pray that we would turn from our wicked ways. God, help us to repent, not just ask for forgiveness when we sin, but actually repent to turn away from our sin and pursue you so that we can do more than just make a point in our culture. We can actually make a difference. I pray for our church, those who call Gateway their home, that we would begin not by judging those outside the church, but we'd take a look inside this house. And we'd see where we're falling short. And we would turn from our wicked ways 
beginning with me, beginning with our ministers, beginning with our elders, beginning with our volunteers, beginning with everyone who calls us our home, home church, we would turn from our wicked ways. And so God, guide us in that direction. Because we're sick of shouting and making a point, we truly want to make a difference for you to see this world come to a saving knowledge of you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I know this has been a little bit of a different message being kind of the 4th of July weekend and some of the cultural issues that are uh, hitting us, but uh, we never want to close out a service without getting, giving you a chance to respond to the gospel, the good news that Jesus came to save sinners like me and like you. And so if there's a response that you need to make to this good news, to, to maybe place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the very first time, follow that up with baptism. Whatever that decision is today, maybe today you just need to sit in your seat and repent. Maybe you need to come forward and repent. I don't know what it is, but if you have a decision to make in regard to the gospel, in regard to what you've heard, uh, I'm going to be up here to your right if you have a response to that. Will you stand and sing as we sing this last song?